Hello, Vision Nation. Most people have heard of how Porsche triggered a short squeeze on VW stock in 2008. One analyst called it MOAS, or the mother of all short squeezes, and it briefly made VW into the most valuable company in the whole world. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that Porsche was facing some big financial headwinds right before the short squeeze went down. Some people even thought the company might go bankrupt. And there's a research paper that came out recently that says the short squeeze probably saved them from going broke in 2008. You know, you always hear about how hedge funds have the upper hand in the markets. Well, this story is about how Porsche outmaneuvered the hedge funds and made the short sellers lose something like 20 billion euros. That research paper on the short squeeze that I talked about was co-authored by Professor Eric Nowak and three other researchers. Now, Professor Nowak holds a PhD degree and he's held visiting appointments at many universities, including Stanford and the University of Chicago. He's currently a professor of finance and is a Swiss Finance Institute faculty member. He's written lots of super interesting papers, and I'm going to include some links to his papers in the show notes. A huge thank you to him for joining me in this episode. And by the way, all the data that he used in his research was taken from court documents. And here's a disclaimer. And so, so we could be reconstruct what happened, or at least our perception or our belief of what happened in this episode, right? So it's always with a disclaimer that this is, let's say, our evidence that we you know, created and we firmly believe in this. But of course, I mean, we cannot rule out that we're lacking some information or some part of it. One last quick announcement before we dive into the story. We're working on a few exciting things for the podcast, so for the time being, new episodes will be released about once a month. Welcome to Wall Street Vision Investing Podcast. This show is on true stories about markets and top investors. I'm Vlad Dolgochev. The show is for informational purposes only and is not investment advice. Check out the show notes for the full disclaimer. So the story starts in Germany in 2005. Porsche held a secret meeting where they decided that they wanted to take over Volkswagen or VW. And that was the catalyst that eventually led to the short squeeze, which led to VW being the most valuable company in the whole world. But before we get to the short squeeze, we've got to go over some important background information. So the reason why VW became so valuable was because Porsche, you know, the small German car maker of, you know, fancy luxury and, and sports cars, right? So, so they were actually trying to take over VW. Okay, um, which, if you think about it, is kind of an you know impossible idea, right? And the reason it was an impossible idea was that VW was a much bigger company than Porsche. It's pretty rare to see a situation where the much smaller company is trying to take over the bigger company. And VW had around 10x more sales than Porsche did at the time, so it was a big difference in their size. But uh, they they had a let's say. A common history, and they also had some some joint ventures going on, right? So, and um, the most famous joint venture between Porsche and VW was actually the the very successful SUV, which is the Porsche Cayenne, right? So, uh, the, because the Porsche Cayenne was actually developed not by Porsche, but in a collaboration with VW, right? So. And uh, so um, everybody knows the Porsche Cayenne, but very few people know the, the VW Touareg, right? So it's essentially the same car, just with a VW under the VW brand, right? So, and which was selling a, a lot less successful than the Porsche Cayenne. But the Porsche Cayenne was the first SUV by Porsche and was a huge worldwide success, right? So Porsche and VW collaborated for many years. 
And a perfect example is that if you bought a Porsche Cayenne, you got the same chassis as the Volkswagen Touareg. They were both assembled on the same factory in Slovakia. Um, and now we have to look a bit into just the facts, right? So I'm not claiming anything here. but So, so when Porsche and um, VW were doing this joint venture collaboration, um, actually the, the, the CEO of VW <laughs> and then later chairman of VW, the chairman of the board, uh, was Ferdinand Piech, who is actually an heir of the Porsche family, right? So, and also the major shareholder, or used to be the major shareholder of Porsche, right? So, so, um, so, so, so we did have a collaboration between a family firm, Porsche, right? So, and a huge, um, <clears throat> car maker, VW, where the CEO and then chairman of the board was a member of, of the Porsche family and, um, basically, uh, a major shareholder. So, um, so that, that's the facts, right? So now everybody can can think about um, the implications of this, you know, in terms of arms length transactions and so forth, and and who would have benefited more from this collaboration. But these situations are always tricky because you can have a certain conflict of interest come up. Ferdinand P. Esch was the nephew of the guy that started the Porsche car company. Now, Ferdinand was a character in his own right. What do I mean by that? Well, he was kind of like the Steve Jobs of the automotive industry. While at VW, this guy did some big moves. He bought Lamborghini and Bentley as brands to join VW. He launched the iconic Porsche 911 and Bugatti Veyron. That's the Bugatti that was the fastest production car in the world at the time. And Ferdinand also achieved massive commercial success for the car companies that he oversaw. Basically, he was an automotive genius. But working for him was another story. He was known to be super tough on his staff, and he would fire people left and right. The people working for him were in a constant state of fear. This guy was an awkward, ruthless leader, and he didn't care about social norms. There's a story about Ferdinand visiting the Emperor of Japan one time. And the Emperor is showing off his personal collection of antique samurai swords. So Ferdinand sees something weird about one of the swords, and he turns to the Emperor and tells him that the sword is a fake. He says this right to the emperor's face. Now that takes some big cojones. So you can imagine that he spoke his mind and didn't really care about being a nice person. I mean, he also had 13 kids from four different women. And two of those kids were from his brother's ex-wife. So he lived a pretty scandalous life. Now the reason I mentioned Ferdinand is because he was an important figure at VW for many years, and I'm sure that he established a lot of their corporate culture. And as Professor Nowak mentioned, he also owned a ton of shares in Porsche, so he had a huge influence in both companies. Now you might be wondering, why did Porsche want to buy out VW in the first place? One of the reasons was because there were some emission laws that came into play where automakers basically had to have a certain level of emissions for their total car fleet. Porsche produced cars with powerful engines, so they would have trouble passing some of those emission laws. But if they joined with VW, they'd be okay, since VW had lots of smaller cars with low emissions. So the average emission of the total car fleet would look a lot better if Porsche and VW were one company. It's one of the reasons that Mercedes bought the Smart brand, for example. Now there was another reason that Porsche wanted to buy lots of shares in VW. At the time, there was a law that required the German government to own a large part of VW. And one of the ways that that law was used was to prevent VW from being taken over by a foreign company. 
VW was basically a really important company to Germany, and that's why they had this specific law in place. And they were also partially owned by the government, right? So, um, so the government, uh, one of German states, um, the, the state of Lower Saxony, you know, had twenty uh, percent of this um, company, right? So, and they also had a huge influence on the company, and uh, so this, <clears throat> they also had a special law which would basically guarantee this influence of the state of Lower Saxony in the company. And this was at that time challenged in the European Union courts, right? So like uh, because some people investors thought, I mean, that's maybe, you know, not in the interest of free mobility of capital and labor and so forth. So, so there was a... Uh, so there was actually a case, you know, in the European courts, and, and a lot of people thought, I mean, this would overturn the law, right? So in the end, it didn't happen, but there was basically an expectation it might happen. And if it might have happened, so uh, at this point in time, VW could have been taken over by someone else, right? So like, or by a big German car maker like, you know, VW, uh, Mercedes Benz or BMW, or by, you know, like a foreign, you know, company and or by head bunch of hedge funds or private equity funds. And so this would, of course, I mean, the first thing a new owner would have done is to, let's say, cut off this, let's say, collaboration between VW and Porsche, which was mainly to the interest of Porsche, not, not VW. So, um, so they had a strong interest, you know, to, to, um, that this shouldn't happen, right? So, and that's why they came up with, with the secret takeover plan. Charlie Munger always talks about how incentives determine behavior. And Porsche had a clear incentive to buy out VW because of the emission laws and because of this potential change in the government ownership law as well. They were actually um, able to accumulate a huge position of, you know, shares, you know, like they, they were like having an October you know, 2008, Porsche was owning you know, like 42.6% of the stock of VW. But they were also having <clears throat> derivative strategies, you know, which gave them like more than 30% of call options on the stock. Okay? So in total, they, they came up with like almost like 74, 75% of the shares okay? at this point of time. At least in theory, right? Okay, so so they started this whole thing in 2005. Okay, so this is when they basically um, decided to do it to 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 try the secret um, takeover, and then they had you know several announcements, particularly in 2007. You know, so and they were always leaking a little bit of information about what they would you know own now of VW but they would always deny that their plan is to take over the company right anybody following the Porsche announcements would be confused it wasn't clear at all if they were trying to buy a majority stake in VW or not okay before we get into the shenanigans that went down let's do a quick explanation of short selling this is important to the story because there were a bunch of hedge funds that shorted a ton of VW stock. At the same time as Porsche was buying up all those shares of VW, these hedge funds saw that VW stock was getting very pricey and they jumped at the opportunity to short it. So with stocks, you can either go long, which means you just buy the stock, hoping that its price is going to increase, or you can go short. When you short a stock, you're hoping that its price is going to go down. So what you're doing is borrowing the shares from someone and immediately selling those shares in the open market. After you sell the shares, you get cash in return. And what happens is eventually you'll need to buy back the shares in the open market and then return them to the person that loaned you the shares in the first place. Now you might be asking, why would someone short a stock in the first place? Well, people generally do it if they think that the stock price is going to decrease. Now there's a few things that you want to keep in mind about short selling. Most investment managers don't do it. Short selling is essentially reserved for specific types of funds or hedge funds. Also, short selling is a riskier type of investment to do and it's generally harder to make money doing it 
because there's technically no limit to your losses. A stock can keep going up in price to infinity. And since there's no upper limit to stock prices, the potential losses for a short position are technically infinite. So as an example, maybe you short a stock that's at $10 a share, and then for some reason it goes to $100 a share, you can lose much more than the initial $10. Now short sellers do play an important role in the markets because they keep things in check. There have been lots of times where short sellers exposed fraud, for example. All right, back to the story. So there were a bunch of these hedge funds that shorted VW stock, and they were hoping that the stock price would decrease. All the people shorting VW stock thought that it was massively overvalued. At the same time, Porsche kept building up this huge position in VW shares. And then, of course, what happened was, so they had built up this huge um, stock of um, VW shares, right? So, and this, um, you know, cash settled call option portfolio. Now, here's the sneaky part. Porsche did buy some VW shares, but they were also owning shares through derivatives. And at the time, when a company owned a certain percent of regular shares in another company, they had to disclose that. But using the derivatives meant that Porsche didn't have to do the same types of disclosures. That was very stealthy. It was a loophole in the regulations. And this meant that most people out there had no idea that Porsche was accumulating this massive position in VW stock. So all those short sellers did not know about this. Now what happened next is that Lehman Brothers went bankrupt in September 2008. And that started this chain reaction where the financial markets were getting a huge shock. And... Um... So uh, so this created a moment, as you know, most of us remember, of, of huge you know, risk and uncertainty in financial markets, right? So like um, huge awareness of counterparty risk, right? So and, um, and uh, nobody trusting each other anymore for overnight money and, and the like. And of course, I mean, how could Porsche have financed this transaction? I mean, they also had uh, huge loans. And uh, that, you know, to, to actually carry out this transaction, right? So, like, they had a bi 10 billion loan facility. And um, so, so they were hugely leveraged at this point in time. And so the idea that they had was that, I mean, VW had these huge cash reserves, you know, of uh, um, 12 billion. And so once they would have taken over the company and, you know, and merged it into, into Porsche, then, of course, they could have access to this, this cash. So, but, but so far, they couldn't. So, and um, at the same time, investors realized the VW stock is completely overvalued. And um, so, uh, so this created a problem for, for the derivative strategy of, of Porsche because they had you know, margin calls, rollover losses, right? So, and in a couple of days, they faced 4 billion euros losses, you know, then another 2.6 billion a couple of days later. So they were really in a liquidity shortage, which was actually, um, you know, risking their own survival, you know? And um, so you remember those options that Porsche used to secretly increase their ownership in VW? Well, those options were like insurance that Porsche provided to other investors. And since the stock market was taking a beating, all of a sudden Porsche was on the hook for billions of euros in losses. When Porsche was using the derivatives to hide the massive amounts of shares that they were buying, they never thought that this global financial meltdown would happen. They didn't think that the price of VW stock would crater. And uh, so according to our calculations, right, so according to our estimates, of course, they deny this and they de denied this in court um, and, and the court somewhat believed them. Um, but according to our estimates, um, they basically would have been bankrupt within less than a week. So Porsche was in a very risky situation. They were facing huge losses 
and the amount of credit in the market dried up quickly. So they couldn't just borrow their way out of this mess. And on top of that, you can imagine that people are not really going to rush out to buy luxury cars in the middle of a global financial crisis. Porsche was in huge trouble. They were getting almost daily margin calls from their brokers, saying that they needed to post more money as collateral. The value of those derivatives changed so much that Porsche ended up losing 15.7 billion euros on paper in a single week in October. Now those were just paper losses, but those derivatives had a month-end rollover, so those losses would have been realized at the end of the month. This meant that Porsche was running out of time and they had to find a miracle solution or they'd probably go broke. So then what happened? So they made a very strange announcement, right? They made a very strange announcement. So they basically announced for the first time that they had an intention to actually increase their holdings to 75%, to above 75%, right? So, and so they, they disclosed their long positions in the stock, okay? And the VW stock, but they didn't disclose what they also had a lot of short positions in the stock. Okay? So in that respect, um, they were both exposed to the long end and the short end. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so what they wanted to make clear was there was a lot of short selling interest in VW because of this huge overvaluation of, of VW as a company. And uh, so um, in that announcement, Porsche made a very clear calculation that they were saying, okay, so we held 74.1% of VW stock in shares and options, call options. Lower Saxony owns another 203 The remaining free front is 5.6%, but there's short interest in the amount of 12%. So we have uncovered short interest of 6.4%. Okay. Um, and that, of course, would mean that, you know, all the short selling institutions, all the short sellers, uh, they, they couldn't cover their positions because there were not enough shares on the market to actually um, give them back to the lenders of the stock. Okay. So it was really unusual. But it led to like a huge panic on the market, right? So, um, so this came as a big surprise to the short selling parties because, I mean, they actually didn't know that Porsche had accumulated this type of grip on the, on, on VW shares. What Porsche didn't mention in their announcement was that they were going through increased margin calls and had rollover losses coming up on those put options that they wrote press release gave the impression that Porsche was hedged against rising stock prices and that Porsche would want lower VW stock prices. Of course, if VW stock went even lower, that would just put Porsche further in the hole. So they didn't mention anything about all those put options in the announcement. As soon as the announcement went out, every short seller freaked right out. The announcement meant that a whole bunch of short sellers were going to be in big trouble if they couldn't get enough shares to close or cover their positions. It was like a fire alarm going off in a huge building and you had everyone rushing for the exits. This meant that the price of VW stock was going to shoot up like crazy and that some of the short sellers would have massive losses. So all of a sudden, there was this huge increase in buying pressure on VW stock because all of the short sellers wanted to return the shares that they had previously borrowed. Um, so the stock price, you know, you know, from 200 went to 520 and then to more than 1,000 euros. That's on October 28 when com Volkswagen company became the most valuable company in the world, right? So... And it created losses on, on short selling, you know, actors, mostly big hedge, big hedge funds, but also other institutions. So, so, I mean, um, there's over 100 big financial institutions who were short on, on VW because they all thought it was overvalued. 
And so the losses, I mean, it's difficult to estimate, but but probably more than 20 billion euros in total had been burned by this event. And uh, so also a lot of, let's say, private investors um, had been burned. So like, uh, the, so there was one German billionaire who actually speculated on 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 this. And uh, so he lost a lot of money and he actually committed suicide. So this is a very dramatic episode, right? So, so um, a lot of people were really affected um, by this event. As an example, an investor who shorted 100 euro of the stock on the Friday before the press release, well, it would have cost them 450 euro to buy it back a few days later. So the losses were huge. I mean, just imagine doing an investment worth $100 and then having to pay back $450 out of pocket because you were on the wrong side of the trade. Brutal. It's estimated that the losses for the hedge funds were around 20 billion euros. At the same time, Porsche made a profit of at least 6 billion euros by triggering the short squeeze because they were able to offload some of their positions at a huge profit. That 6 billion euros is almost double Porsche's 2020 profit. So it was a huge payday. Now you might be thinking, what about all those hedge fund folks? If you've ever met someone who works at a hedge fund, you'll know that they're some of the most competitive and hardworking people that you'll ever meet in your life. So they're not just going to let something like this slide. So a bunch of them launched lawsuits. The Porsche CEO and chief financial officer were accused of market manipulation. Their charges were acquitted in 2016. There was another lawsuit for 1.2 billion euros filed on behalf of the hedge funds. The German courts dismissed that suit as well. And there are still ongoing legal issues related to the short squeeze. For me, this whole episode highlights that sometimes a freak black swan event can do serious damage to your portfolio. Those hedge funds had super smart people working for them and they still got caught in this crazy situation. Now, as Professor Nowak mentioned, short sellers are generally disliked by everybody. But he did bring up a great point about short sellers. As I mentioned earlier, a very important player and correcting force in financial markets, right? So, like, if... If we put them in a bad light and uh, they stop their work, then this will lead to you know, permanent overvaluation in stock markets, right? So and that's not something that, that we want to have. Right? So so I used to say we need to protect all types of investors, right? So long investors, retail investors, but also the, the short selling guys. Huh? We need to protect also the shorties. <laughs> Professor Nowak has some very interesting papers and he's working on really interesting topics today as well. I'm going to link to all this stuff in the show notes. I can mention that we have produced a follow-up paper, which is also a kind of similar, which is on this meme stock events, right? So around GameStop, which is called, which we have called uh, shorting stocks through social <clears throat> um, media, right? So because that's where it happens. So which is a bit more of a recent phenomenon, but we also see... Um, a lot of incidences for short squeezes in these events. Um, and besides that, I'm currently doing a lot of research on what is you know, called ESG or especially climate finance because that's a super important topic as well. Uh, but uh, we also do have markets which are not, let's say, fully functional yet pricing, for example, a ton of carbon as, as it should be priced. Right? So, but, uh, so that's a bit an outlook for the future. But of course, uh, everyone is uh, happily invited to take a look at my personal homepage or my social science research network, SSRN.com page and, and download my research papers or write an email to me and you know, ask about what I just said today or any other type of research they might be interested in. Huh? So I'm always happy to discuss these things. Huh? So. All right, Vision Nation, that wraps it up for this week's episode. If you've enjoyed it, please hit the subscribe button, leave a review, and if you know someone who's interested in investing, please share this episode with them. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you have an amazing day. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. 
before making any decisions, consult a professional. I may maintain positions in the securities discussed on this podcast. This show is copyrighted by the Wall Street Vision. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.